Section 4 of The Spirit of Youth in the City Streets. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Spirit of Youth and the City Streets by Jane Addams. Read by Mary Schneider. Chapter 4 The House of Dreams. To the preoccupied adult who is prone to use the city street as a mere passageway from one hurried duty to another, nothing is more touching than his encounter with a group of children and young people who are emerging from a theater with the magic of the play still thick upon them. They look up and down the familiar street, scarcely recognizing it and quite unable to determine the direction of home. From a tangle of make-believe they gravely scrutinize the real world, which they are so reluctant to re-enter, reminding one of the absorbed gaze of a child who is groping his way back from fairyland, whether the story has completely transported him. Going to the show for thousands of young people in every industrial city is the only possible road to the realms of mystery and romance. The theater is the only place where they can satisfy that craving for a conception of life higher than that which the actual world offers them. In a very real sense, the drama and the drama alone performs for them the office of art, as is clearly revealed in their blundering demand stated in many forms for a play unlike life. The theater becomes to them a veritable house of dreams infinitely more real than the noisy streets in the crowded factories. This first simple demand upon the theater for romance is closely allied to one more complex, which might be described as a search for solace and distraction in those moments of first awakening from the glamour of a youth's interpretation of life to the sterner realities which are thrust upon his consciousness. These perceptions, which inevitably close around and imprison the spirit of youth, are perhaps never so grim as in the case of the wage-earning child. We can all recall our own moments of revolt against life's actualities, our reluctance to admit that all life was to be as unheroic and uneventful as that which we saw about us. It was too unbearable that this was all there was, and we tried every possible avenue of escape. As we made an effort to believe, in spite of what we saw, that life was noble and harmonious, as we stubbornly clung to posy in contradiction to the testimony of our senses, so we see thousands of young people thronging the theaters, bent in their turn upon the same quest. The drama provides a transition between the romantic conceptions which they vainly struggle to keep intact, and life's cruelties and trivialities which they refuse to admit. A child whose imagination has been cultivated is able to do this for himself through reading and reverie, but for the overworked city youth of meager education, perhaps nothing but the theater is able to perform this important office. The theater also has a strange power to forecast life for the youth. Each boy comes from our ancestral past not in entire forgetfulness, and quite as he unconsciously uses ancient war cries in his street play, so he longs to reproduce and to see set before him the valors and vengeances of a society embodying a much more primitive state of morality than that in which he finds himself. Mr. Patton has pointed out that the elemental action which the stage presents, the old emotions of love and jealousy, of revenge and daring, take the thoughts of the spectator back into deep and well-worn channels in which his mind runs with a sense of rest afforded by nothing else. The cheap drama brings cause and effect, willpower and action, once more into relation, and gives a man the thrilling conviction that he may yet be master of his fate. The youth, of course, quite unconscious of this psychology, views the deeds of the hero simply as a forecast of his own future, and it is this fascinating view of his own career which draws the boy to shows of all sorts. They can scarcely be too improbable for him, portraying as they do his belief in his own prowess. A series of slides, which has lately been very popular in the five-cent theaters of Chicago, portrayed five masked men breaking into a humble dwelling, killing the father of the family and carrying away the family treasure. The golden-haired son of the house, age seven, vows eternal vengeance on the spot, 
and follows one villain after another to his doom the execution of each is shown in lurid detail and the last slide of the series depicts the hero aged ten kneeling upon his father's grave counting on the fingers of one hand the number of men that he has killed and thanking god that he has been permitted to be an instrument of vengeance in another series of slides a poor woman is wearily bending over some sewing a baby is crying in the cradle and two little boys of nine and ten are asking for food in despair the mother sends them out into the street to beg but instead they steal a revolver from a pawn shop and with it kill a chinese laundryman robbing him of two hundred dollars they rush home with the treasure which is found by the mother in the baby's cradle whereupon she and her sons fall upon their knees and send up a prayer of thankfulness for this timely and heaven-sent assistance is it not astounding that a city allows thousands of its youths to fill their impressionable minds with these absurdities which certainly will become the foundation for their working moral codes and the data from which they will judge the proprieties of life it is as if a child starved at home should be forced to go out and search for food selecting quite naturally not that which is nourishing but that which is exciting and appealing to his outward sense often in his ignorance and foolishness blundering into substances which are filthy and poisonous out of my twenty years experience at hull house i can recall all sorts of pilferings petty larcenies and even burglaries due to that never-ceasing effort on the part of boys to procure theatre tickets i can also recall indirect efforts towards the same end which are most pitiful I remember the remorse of a young girl of fifteen who was brought into the juvenile court after a night spent weeping in the cellar of her home because she had stolen a mass of artificial flowers with which to trim a hat. She stated that she had taken the flowers because she was afraid of losing the attention of a young man whom she had heard say that a girl has to be dressy if she expects to be seen this young man was the only one who had ever taken her to the theatre and if he failed her she was sure that she would never go again and she sobbed out incoherently that she couldn't live at all without it apparently the blankness and grayness of life itself had been broken for her only by the portrayal of a different world one boy whom i had known from babyhood began to take money from his mother from the time he was seven years old and after he was ten she regularly gave him money for the play saturday evening however the saturday performance starting him off like he always went twice again on sunday procuring the money in all sorts of illicit ways practically all of his earnings after he was fourteen were spent in this way to satisfy the insatiable desire to know of the great adventures of the wide world which the more fortunate boy takes out in reading homer and stevenson in talking with his mother i was reminded of my experience one sunday afternoon in russia when the employees of a large factory were seated in an open-air theatre watching with breathless interest the presentation of folk stories i was told that troops of actors went from one manufacturing establishment to another presenting the simple elements of history and literature to the illiterate employees this tendency to slake the thirst for adventure by viewing the drama is of course but a blind and primitive effort in the direction of culture for he who makes himself its vessel and bearer thereby acquires a freedom from the blindness and soul poverty of daily existence it is partly in response to this need that more sophisticated young people often go to the theatre hoping to find a clue of life's perplexities many times the bewildered hero reminds one of emerson's description of margaret fuller i don't know where i am going follow me nevertheless the stage is dealing with the moral themes in which the public is most interested and while many young people go to the theatre if only to see represented and to hear discussed the themes which seem to them so tragically important there is no doubt that what they hear there flimsy and poor as it often is easily becomes their actual moral guide in moments of moral crisis they turn to the sayings of the hero who found himself in a similar plight the sayings may not be profound but at least they are applicable to conduct in the last few years scores of plays have been put upon the stage 
whose titles might be easily translated into proper headings for sociological lectures or sermons without including the plays of ibsen shaw and houtman which deal so directly with moral issues that the moralists themselves wince under their teachings and declare them brutal but it is this very brutality which the over-refined and complicated city dwellers often crave moral teaching has become so intricate creeds so metaphysical that in a state of absolute reaction they demand definite instruction for daily living their wholehearted acceptance of the teaching corroborates the statement recently made by an english playwright that quote, the theatre is literally making the minds of our urban populations today it is a huge factory of sentiment of character of points of honor of conceptions of conduct of everything that finally determines the destiny of a nation the theatre is not only a place of amusement it is a place of culture a place where people learn how to think act and feel end quote. seldom however do we associate the theatre with our plans for civic righteousness although it has become so important a factor in city life one sunday evening last winter an investigation was made of four hundred and sixty six theatres in the city of chicago it was discovered that in the majority of them the leading theme was revenge the lover following his rival the outraged husband seeking his wife's paramour or the wiping out by death of a blot on a hitherto unstained honor it was estimated that one-sixth of the entire population of the city had attended the theatres on that day at that same moment the churches throughout the city were preaching the gospel of good will is not this a striking commentary upon the contradictory influences to which the city youth is constantly subjected the discrepancy between the church and the stage is at times apparently recognized by the five-cent theatre itself and a blundering attempt is made to suffuse the songs and moving pictures with piety nothing could more absurdly demonstrate this attempt than a song illustrated by pictures describing the adventures of a young man who follows a pretty girl through street after street in the hope of snatching a kiss from her ruby lips the young man is overjoyed when a sudden windstorm drives the girl to shelter under an archway and he is about to succeed in his attempt when the good lord ever watchful over innocence makes the same wind blow a cloud of dust into the eyes of the rubberneck and his foul purpose is foiled this attempt at piety is also shown in a series of films depicting bible stories and the passion play of oberammergau forecasting the time when the moving film will be viewed as a mere mechanical device for the use of the church the school and the library as well as for the theatre at present however most improbable tales hold the attention of the youth of the city night after night and feed his starved imagination as nothing else succeeds in doing in addition to these fascinations the five-cent theatre is also fast becoming the general social centre and clubhouse in many crowded neighbourhoods it is easy of access from the street the entire family of parents and children can attend for a comparatively small sum of money and the performance lasts for at least an hour and in some of the humbler theatres the spectators are not disturbed for a second hour the room which contains the mimic stage is small and cosy and less formal than the regular theatre and there is much more gossip and social life as if the foyer and pit were mingled the very darkness of the room necessary for an exhibition of the films is an added attraction to many young people for whom the space is filled with the glamour of love-making hundreds of young people attend these five-cent theatres every evening in the week including sunday and what is seen and heard there becomes the sole topic of conversation forming the ground pattern for their social life that mutual understanding which in another social circle is provided by books travel and all the arts is here compressed into the topics suggested by the play the young people attend the five-cent theatres in groups with something of the gang instinct boasting of the films and stunts in our theatre they find a certain advantage in attending one theatre regularly for the habitues are often invited to come upon the stage on amateur nights which occur at least once a week in all the theatres 
This is, of course, a most exciting experience. If the stunt does not meet with the approval of the audience, the performer is greeted with jeers and a long hook pulls him off the stage. If, on the other hand, he succeeds in pleasing the audience, he may be paid for his performance and later register with a booking agency, the address of which is supplied by the obliging manager, and thus he fancies that a lucrative and exciting career is opening before him. Almost every night at six o'clock a long line of children may be seen waiting at the entrance of these booking agencies, of which there are fifteen that are well known in Chicago. Thus the only art which is constantly placed before the eyes of the temperamental youth is a debased form of dramatic art and a vulgar type of music, for the success of a song in these theaters depends not so much upon its musical rendition as upon the vulgarity of its appeal. In a song which held the stage of a cheap theater in Chicago for weeks, the young singer was helped out by a bit of mirror from which she threw a flash of light into the faces of successive boys whom she selected from the audience as she sang the refrain, You are my affinity. Many popular songs relate the vulgar experiences of a city man wandering from amusement park to bathing beach in search of flirtations. It may be that these stunts and recitals of city adventure contain the nucleus of coming poesy and romance, as the songs and recitals of the early minstrels sprang directly from the life of the people. But all the more does the effort need help and direction, both in the development of its technique and the material of its themes. The few attempts which have been made in this direction are astonishingly rewarding to those who regard the power of self-expression as one of the most precious boons of education. The Children's Theater in New York is the most successful example, but every settlement in which dramatics have been systematically fostered can also testify to a surprisingly quick response to this form of art on the part of young people. The Hull House Theater is constantly besieged by children, clamoring to take part in the plays of Schiller, Shakespeare, and Moliere, although they know it means weeks of rehearsal and the complete memorizing of stiff lines. The audiences sit enthralled by the final rendition, and other children whose tastes have supposedly been debased by constant vaudeville are pathetically eager to come again and again. Even when still more is required from the young actors, research into the special historic period, copying costumes from old plates, hours of labor that the TH may be restored to its proper place in English speech, their enthusiasm is unquenched. But quite aside from its educational possibilities, one never ceases to marvel at the power of even a mimic stage to afford to the young a magic space in which life may be lived in efflorescence, where manners may be courtly and elaborate without exciting ridicule, where the sequence of events is impressive and comprehensible. Order and beauty of life is what the adolescent youth craves above all else, as the younger child indefatigably demands his story. Is this where the most beautiful princess in the world lives? asks a little girl peering into the door of the Hull House Theatre. Or does Alice in Wonderland always stay here? It is much easier for her to put her feeling into words than it is for the youth who has enchantingly rendered the gentle poetry of Ben Jonson's Sad Shepherd, or for him who has walked the boards as Southey's Watt Tyler. His association, however, is quite as clinging and magical as the child's, although he can only say, gee, I wish I could always feel the way I did that night. Something would be doing then. Nothing of the artist's pleasure, nor of the revelation of that large world which surrounds and completes our own, is lost to him because a careful technique has been exacted. On the contrary, this has only dignified and enhanced it. It would also be easy to illustrate youth's eagerness for artistic expression from the recitals given by the pupils of the New York Music School settlement or by those of the Hull House Music School. These attempts also combine social life with the training of the artistic sense and in this approximate the fascinations of the five-cent theater. 
this spring a group of young girls accustomed to the life of a five-cent theater reluctantly refused an invitation to go to the country for a day's outing because the return on a late train would compel them to miss one evening's performance they found it impossible to tear themselves away not only from the excitements of the theater itself but from the gaiety of the crowd of young men and girls invariably gathered outside discussing the sensational posters a steady english shopkeeper lately complained that unless he provided his four daughters with money for the five-cent theatres every evening they would steal it from his till and he feared that they might be driven to procure it in even more illicit ways because his entire family life had been thus disrupted he gloomily asserted that this cheap show has ruined his home and was the curse of america this father was able to formulate the anxiety of many immigrant parents who are absolutely bewildered by the keen absorption of their children in the cheap theatre this anxiety is not indeed without foundation an eminent alienist of chicago states that he has had a number of patients among neurotic children whose emotional natures have been so overwrought by the crude appeal to which they had been so constantly subjected in the theatres that they have become victims of hallucination and mental disorder the statement of this physician may be the first note of alarm which will awaken the city to its duty in regard to the theatre so that it shall at least be made safe and sane for the city child whose senses are already so abnormally developed this testimony of a physician that the conditions are actually pathological may at last induce us to bestir ourselves in regard to procuring a more wholesome form of public recreation many efforts in social amelioration have been undertaken only after such exposures in the meantime while the occasional child is driven distraught a hundred children permanently injure their eyes watching the moving films and hundreds more seriously model their conduct upon the standards set before them on this mimic stage three boys aged nine eleven and thirteen who had recently seen depicted the adventures of frontier life including the holding up of a stagecoach and the lassoing of the driver spent weeks planning to lasso murder and rob a neighborhood milkman who started on his route at four o'clock in the morning they made their headquarters in a barn and saved enough money to buy a revolver adopting as their watchword the phrase dead men tell no tales one spring morning the conspirators with their faces covered with black cloth lay in ambush for the milkman fortunately for him as the lariat was thrown the horse shied and although the shot was appropriately fired the milkman's life was saved such a direct influence of the theatre is by no means rare even among older boys thirteen young lads were brought into the municipal court in chicago during the first week that raffles the amateur cracksman was upon the stage each one with an outfit of burglar's tools in his possession and each one shamefacedly admitting that the gentlemanly burglar in the play has suggested to him a career of similar adventure in so far as the illusions of the theatre succeed in giving youth the rest and recreation which comes from following a more primitive code of morality it has a close relation to the function performed by public games it is of course less valuable because the sense of participation is largely confined to the emotions and the imagination and does not involve the entire nature we might illustrate by the wild west show in which the onlooking boy imagines himself an active participant the scouts the indians the bucking ponies are his real intimate companions and occupy his entire mind in contrast with this we have the omnipresent game of tag which is doubtless also founded upon the chase it gives the boy exercise and momentary echoes of the old excitement but it is barren of suggestion and quickly degenerates into horseplay well-considered public games easily carried out in a park or athletic field might both fill the mind with the imaginative material constantly supplied by the theatre and also afford the activity which the cramped muscles of the town dweller so sorely need even the unquestioned ability which the theatre possesses 
to bring men together into a common mood and to afford them a mutual topic of conversation is better accomplished with the one national game which we already possess and might be infinitely extended through the organization of other public games the theatre even now by no means competes with the baseball league games which are attended by thousands of men and boys who during the entire summer discuss the respective standings of each nine and the relative merits of every player during the noon hour all the employees of a city factory gather in the nearest vacant lot to cheer their own home team in its practice for the next game with the nine of a neighboring manufacturing establishment and on a saturday afternoon the entire male population of the city betakes itself to the baseball field the ordinary means of transportation are supplemented by gay stagecoaches and huge automobiles noisy with blowing horns and decked with gay pennants the enormous crowd of cheering men and boys are talkative good-natured full of the holiday spirit and absolutely released from the grind of life they are lifted out of their individual affairs and so fused together that a man cannot tell whether it is his own shout or another's that fills his ears whether it is his own coat or another's that he is wildly waving to celebrate a victory he does not call the stranger who sits next to him his brother but he unconsciously embraces him in an overwhelming outburst of kindly feeling when the favorite player makes a home run does not this contain a suggestion of the undoubted power of public recreation to bring together all classes of a community in the modern city unhappily so full of devices for keeping men apart already some american cities are making a beginning toward more adequate public recreation boston has its municipal gymnasiums cricket fields and golf grounds chicago has seventeen parks with playing fields gymnasiums and baths which at present enroll thousands of young people these same parks are provided with beautiful halls which are used for many purposes rent free and are given over to any group of young people who wish to conduct dancing parties subject to city supervision and chaperonage many social clubs have deserted neighboring saloon halls for these municipal drawing-rooms beautifully decorated with growing plants supplied by the park greenhouses and flooded with electric lights supplied by the park powerhouse in the saloon halls the young people were obliged to pass money freely over the bar and in order to make the most of the occasion they usually stayed until morning at such times the economic necessity itself would override the counsels of the more temperate and the thrifty doorkeeper would not insist upon invitations but would take in any one who had the price of a ticket the free rent in the park hall the good food in the park restaurant supplied at cost have made three parties closing at eleven o'clock no more expensive than one party breaking up at daylight too often in disorder is not this an argument that the drinking the late hours the lack of decorum are directly traceable to the commercial enterprise which ministers to pleasure in order to drag it into excess because excess is more profitable to thus commercialize pleasure is as monstrous as it is to commercialize art it is intolerable that the city does not take over this function of making provision for pleasure as wise communities in sweden and south carolina have taken the sale of alcohol out of the hands of enterprising publicans we are only beginning to understand what might be done through the festival the street procession the band of marching musicians orchestral music in public squares or parks with the magic power they all possess to formulate the sense of companionship and solidarity the experiments which are being made in public schools to celebrate the national holidays the changing seasons the birthdays of heroes the planting of trees are slowly developing little ceremonials which may in time work out into pageants of genuine beauty and significance no other nation has so unparalleled an opportunity to do this through its schools as we have for no other nation has so wide-spreading a school system while the enthusiasm of children and their natural ability to express their emotions through symbols gives the securest possible foundation to this growing effort 
the city schools of new york have affected the organization of high school girls into groups for folk dancing these old forms of dancing which have been worked out in many lands and through long experiences safeguard unwary and dangerous expression and yet afford a vehicle through which the gaiety of youth may flow their forms are indeed those which lie at the basis of all good breeding forms which at once express and restrain urge forward and set limits one may also see another center of growth for public recreation and the beginning of a pageantry for the people in the many small parks and athletic fields which almost every american city is hastening to provide for its youth these small parks have innumerable athletic teams each with its distinctive uniform with track meets and match games arranged with the teams from other parks and from the public schools choruses of trade unionists or of patriotic societies fill the park halls with eager listeners labor day processions are yearly becoming more carefully planned and more picturesque in character as the desire to make an overwhelming impression with mere size gives way to a growing ambition to set forth the significance of the craft and skill of the workmen at moments they almost rival the dignified showing of the processions of the german turn verines which are also often seen in our city streets the many foreign colonies which are found in all american cities afford an enormous reserve of material for public recreation and street festival they not only celebrate the feasts and holidays of the fatherland but have each their own public expression for their mutual benefit societies and for the observance of american anniversaries from the gay celebration of the scandinavians when war was averted and two neighboring nations were united to the equally gay celebration of the centenary of garibaldi's birth from the chinese dragon cleverly trailing its way through the streets to the greek banners flung out in honor of immortal heroes there is an infinite variety of suggestions and possibilities for public recreation and for the corporate expression of stirring emotions after all what is the function of art but to preserve in permanent and beautiful form those emotions and solaces which cheer life and make it kindlier more heroic and easier to comprehend which lift the mind of the worker from the harshness and loneliness of his task and by connecting him with what has gone before free him from a sense of isolation and hardship were american cities really eager for municipal art they would cherish as genuine beginnings the tarantella danced so interminably at italian weddings the primitive greek pipe played throughout the long summer nights the bohemian theatres crowded with eager slavophiles the hungarian musicians strolling from street to street the fervid oratory of the young russians preaching social righteousness in the open square many chicago citizens who attended the first annual meeting of the national playground association of america will never forget the long summer day in the large playing field filled during the morning with hundreds of little children romping through the kindergarten games in the afternoon with the young men and girls contending in athletic sports and the evening light made gay by the bright colored garments of italians lithuanians norwegians and a dozen other nationalities reproducing their old dances and festivals for the pleasure of the more stolid americans was this a forecast of what we may yet see accomplished through a dozen agencies promoting public recreation which are springing up in every city of america as they already are found in the large towns of scotland and england let us cherish these experiments as the most precious beginnings of an attempt to supply the recreational needs of our industrial cities to fail to provide for the recreation of youth is not only to deprive all of them of their natural form of expression but is certain to subject some of them to the overwhelming temptation of illicit and self-destroying pleasures to insist that young people shall forecast their rosy-colored future only in a house of dreams is to deprive the real world of that warmth and reassurance which it so sorely needs and to which it is justly entitled furthermore we are left outside with a sense of dreariness in company with that shadow which already lurks only around the corner for most of us a skepticism of life's value that's the end of chapter four
life of the spirit of youth in the city streets. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Spirit of Youth and the City Streets by Jane Addams, read by Mary Schneider. Chapter 5 The Spirit of Youth and Industry as it is possible to establish a connection between the lack of public recreation and the vicious excitements and trivial amusements which become their substitutes, so it may be illuminating to trace the connection between the monotony and dullness of factory work and the petty immoralities which are often the youth's protest against them. There are many city neighborhoods in which practically every young person who has attained the age of fourteen years enters a factory. When the work itself offers nothing of interest, and when no public provision is made for recreation, the situation becomes almost insupportable to the youth whose ancestors have been rough-working and hard-playing peasants. In such neighborhoods the joy of youth is well-nigh extinguished, and in that long procession of factory workers each morning and evening the young walk almost as wearily and listlessly as the old. Young people working in modern factories situated in cities still dominated by the ideals of Puritanism face a combination which tends almost irresistibly to overwhelm the spirit of youth. When the Puritan repression of pleasure was in the ascendant in America, the people it dealt with lived on farms and villages where, although youthful pleasures might be frowned upon and crushed out, the young people still had a chance to find self-expression in their work ploughing the fields and spinning the flax could be carried on with a certain joyousness and vigor which the organization of modern industry too often precludes present industry based upon the inventions of the nineteenth century has little connection with the old patterns in which men have worked for generations the modern factory calls for an expenditure of nervous energy almost more than it demands muscular effort or at least machinery so far performs the work of the massive muscles that greater stress is laid upon fine and exact movements necessarily involving nervous strain but these movements are exactly of the type to which the muscles of a growing boy least readily respond quite as the admonition to be accurate and faithful is that which appeals the least to his big primitive emotions the demands made upon his eyes are complicated and trivial the use of his muscles is fussy and monotonous the relation between cause and effect is remote and obscure apparently no one is concerned as to what may be done to aid him in this process and to relieve it of its dullness and difficulty to mitigate its strain and harshness perhaps never before have young people been expected to work from motives so detached from direct emotional incentive never has the age of marriage been so long delayed never has the work of youth been so separated from the family life and the public opinion of the community education alone can repair these losses it alone has the power of organizing a child's activities with some reference to the life he will later lead and of giving him a clue as to what to select and what to eliminate when he comes into contact with contemporary social and industrial conditions and until educators take hold of the situation the rest of the community is powerless in vast regions of the city which are completely dominated by the factory it is as if the development of industry had outrun all the educational and social arrangements the revolt of youth against uniformity and the necessity of following careful directions laid down by someone else many times results in such nervous irritability that the youth in spite of all sorts of prudential reasons throws up his job if only to get outside the factory walls into the freer street just as the narrowness of the school enclosure induces many a boy to jump the fence when the boy is on the street however and is standing around on the corner with the gang to which he mysteriously attaches himself he finds the difficulties of direct untrammeled action almost as great there as they were in the factory but for an entirely different set of reasons the necessity so strongly felt in the factory for an outlet to his sudden and furious bursts of energy his overmastering desire to prove that he could do things without being bossed all the time finds little chance for expression for he discovers that in whatever really active pursuit he tries to engage he is promptly suppressed by the police after several futile attempts at self-expression he returns to his street corner subdued and so far discouraged 
that when he has the next impulse to vigorous action he concludes that it is of no use and sullenly settles back into inactivity he thus learns to persuade himself that it is better to do nothing or as the psychologist would say to inhibit his motor impulses when the same boy as an adult workman finds himself confronted with an unusual or an untoward condition in his work he will fall back into this habit of inhibition of making no effort toward independent action when slack times come he will be the workman of least value and the first to be dismissed calmly accepting his position in the ranks of the unemployed because it will not be so unlike the many hours of idleness and vacuity to which he was accustomed as a boy no help having been extended to him in the moment of his first irritable revolt against industry his whole life has been given a twist toward idleness and futility he has not had the chance of recovery which the school system gives a like rebellious boy in a truant school the unjustifiable lack of educational supervision during the first years of factory work makes it quite impossible for the modern educator to offer any real assistance to young people during that trying transitional period between school and industry the young people themselves who fail to conform can do little but rebel against the entire situation and the expressions of revolt roughly divide themselves into three classes the first resulting in idleness may be illustrated from many a sad story of a boy or a girl who has spent in the first spurt of premature and uninteresting work all the energy which should have carried them through years of steady endeavor i recall a boy who had worked steadily for two years as a helper in a smelting establishment and had conscientiously brought home all his wages one night suddenly announcing to his family that he was too tired and too hot to go on as no amount of persuasion could make him alter his decision the family finally threatened to bring him into the juvenile court on a charge of incorrigibility whereupon the boy disappeared and such efforts as the family have been able to make in the two years since have failed to find him they are convinced that he is trying a spell of tramping and wish that they had let him have a vacation the first summer when he wanted it so bad the boy may find in the rough outdoor life the healing which a wise physician would recommend for nervous exhaustion although the tramp experiment is a perilous one this revolt against factory monotony is sometimes closely allied to that moral fatigue which results from assuming responsibility prematurely i recall the experience of a scotch girl of eighteen who with her older sister worked in a candy factory their combined earnings supporting a paralytic father the older girl met with an accident involving the loss of both eyes and the financial support of the whole family devolved upon the younger girl who worked hard and conscientiously for three years supplementing her insufficient factory wages by evening work at glove making in the midst of this devotion and monotonous existence she made the acquaintance of a girl who was a chorus singer in a cheap theatre and the contrast between her monotonous drudgery and the glitter of the stage broke down her allegiance to her helpless family she left the city absolutely abandoning the kindred to whom she had been so long devoted and announced that if they all starved she would never go into a factory again every effort failed to find her after the concert troupe left milwaukee and although the pious scotch father felt that she had been ensnared by the devil and had brought his gray hairs in sorrow to the grave i could not quite dismiss the case with this simple explanation but was haunted by all sorts of social implications the second line of revolt manifests itself in an attempt to make up for the monotony of the work by a constant change from one occupation to another this is an almost universal experience among thousands of young people in their first impact with the industrial world the startling results of the investigation undertaken in massachusetts by the douglas commission showed how casual and demoralizing the first few years of factory life become to thousands of unprepared boys and girls in their first restlessness and maladjustment they change from one factory to another working only for a few weeks or months in each and they exhibit no interest in any of them save for the amount of wages paid at the end of their second year of employment many of them are less capable than when they left school and are actually receiving less wages 
the report of the commission made clear that while the two years between fourteen and sixteen were most valuable for educational purposes they were almost useless for industrial purposes that no trade would receive as an apprentice a boy under sixteen that no industry requiring skill and workmanship could utilize these untrained children and that they not only demoralized themselves but in a sense industry itself an investigation of one thousand tenement children in new york who had taken out their working papers at the age of fourteen reported that during the first working year a third of them had averaged six places each these reports but confirm the experience of those of us who live in an industrial neighborhood and who continually see these restless young workers in fact there are moments when this constant changing seems to be all that saves them from the fate of those other children who hold on to a monotonous task so long that they finally incapacitate themselves for all work it often seems to me an expression of the instinct of self-preservation as in the case of a young swedish boy who during a period of two years abandoned one piece of factory work after another saying he could not stand it until in the chagrin following the loss of his ninth place he announced his intention of leaving the city and allowing his mother and little sisters to shift for themselves at this critical juncture a place was found for him as lineman in a telephone company climbing telephone poles and handling wires apparently supplied him with the elements of outdoor activity and danger which were necessary to hold his interest and he became the steady support of his family but while we know the discouraging effect of idleness upon the boy who has thrown up his job and refuses to work again and we also know the restlessness and lack of discipline resulting from the constant change from one factory to another there is still a third manifestation of maladjustment of which one's memory and the juvenile court records unfortunately furnish many examples the spirit of revolt in these cases has led to distinct disaster two stories will perhaps be sufficient in illustration although they might be multiplied indefinitely from my own experience a russian girl who went to work at an early age in a factory pasting labels on mucilage bottles was obliged to surrender all her wages to her father who in turn gave her only the barest necessities of life in a fit of revolt against the monotony of her work and that nasty sticky stuff she stole from her father three hundred dollars which he had hidden away under the floor of his kitchen and with this money she ran away to a neighboring city for a spree having first bought herself the most gorgeous clothing a local department store could supply of course this preposterous beginning could have but one end and the child was sent to reform school to expiate not only her own sins but the sins of those who had failed to rescue her from a life of grinding monotony which her spirit could not brook i know the judge thinks i am a bad girl sobbed the poor little prisoner put under bonds for threatening to kill her lover but i have only been bad for one week and before that i was good for six years i worked every day in blank's factory and took home all my wages to keep the kids in school i met this fellow in a dance hall i just had to go to dances sometimes after pushing down the lever of my machine with my right foot and using both my arms feeding it for ten hours a day nobody knows how i felt some nights i agreed to go away with this man for a week but when i was ready to go home he tried to drive me out on the street to earn money for him and of course i threatened to kill him any decent girl would she concluded as unconscious of the irony of the reflection as she was of the connection between her lurid week and her monotonous years knowing as educators do that thousands of the city youth will enter factory life at an age as early as the state law will permit instructed as the modern teacher is as to youth's requirements for a normal mental and muscular development it is hard to understand the apathy in regard to youth's inevitable experience in modern industry are the educators like the rest of us so caught in admiration of the astonishing achievements of modern industry that they forget the children themselves a scotch educator who recently visited america considered it very strange that with a remarkable industrial development all about us affording such amazing educational opportunities our schools should continually cling to a past which did not fit the american temperament was not adapted to our needs and made no vigorous pull upon our faculties 
he concluded that our educators overwhelmed by the size and vigor of american industry were too timid to seize upon the industrial situation and to extract its enormous educational value he lamented that this lack of courage and initiative failed not only to fit the child for an intelligent and conscious participation in industrial life but that it was reflected in the industrial development itself that the industry had fallen back into old habits and repeated traditional mistakes until american cities exhibited stupendous extensions of the medievalisms in the traditional ghetto and of the hideousness of the black country of lancashire he contended that this condition is the inevitable result of separating education from contemporary life education becomes unreal and far-fetched while industry becomes ruthless and materialistic in spite of the severity of the indictment one much more severe and well deserved might have been brought against us he might have accused us not only of wasting but of misusing and trampling under foot the first tender instincts and impulses which are the source of all charm and beauty and art because we fail to realize that by premature factory work for which the youth is unprepared society perpetually extinguishes that variety and promise that bloom of life which is the unique possession of the young he might have told us that our cities would continue to be traditionally cramped and dreary until we comprehend that youth alone has the power to bring to reality the vision of the coming city of mankind full of life full of the spirit of creation a few educational experiments are carried on in cincinnati in boston and in chicago in which the leaders of education and industry unite in a common aim and purpose a few more are carried on by trade unionists who in at least two of the trades are anxious to give to their apprentices and journeymen the wider culture afforded by the capitalistic trade schools which they suspect of preparing strikebreakers still a few other schools have been found by public-spirited citizens to whom the situation has become unendurable and one or two more such experiments are attached to the public school system itself all of these schools are still blundering in method and unsatisfactory in their results but a certain trade school for girls in new york which is preparing young girls of fourteen for the sewing trade already so overcrowded and subdivided that there remains very little education for the worker is conquering this difficult industrial situation by equipping each apprentice with the informing mind if a child goes into a sewing factory with a knowledge of the work she is doing in relation to the finished product if she is informed concerning the material she is manipulating and the processes to which it is subjected if she understands the design she is elaborating in its historic relation to art and decoration her daily life is lifted from drudgery to one of self-conscious activity and her pleasure and intelligence is registered in her product i remember a little colored girl in this new york school who was drawing for the pattern she was about to embroider a carefully elaborated acanthus leaf upon my inquiry as to the design she replied it is what the egyptians used to put on everything because they saw it so much growing in the nile and then the greeks copied it and sometimes you can find it now on the buildings downtown she added shyly of course i like it awfully well because it was first used by people living in africa where the colored folks come from such a reasonable interest in work not only reacts upon the worker but is of course registered in the product itself such genuine pleasure is in pitiful contrast to the usual manifestation of the play spirit as it is found in the factories where at the best its expression is illicit and often is attended with great danger there are many touching stories by which this might be illustrated one of them comes from a large steel mill of a boy of fifteen whose business it was to throw a lever when a small tank became filled with molten metal during the first moments when the tank was filling it was his foolish custom to catch the reflection of the metal upon a piece of looking-glass and to throw the bit of light into the eyes of his fellow workmen although an exasperated foreman had twice dispossessed him of his mirror with a third fragment he was one day flicking the gloom of the shop when the neglected tank overflowed almost instantly burning off both his legs 
boys working in the stockyards during their moments of wrestling and rough play often slash each other painfully with the short knives which they use in their work but in spite of this the play impulse is too irrepressible to be denied if educators could go upon a voyage of discovery into that army of boys and girls who enter industry each year what values might they not discover what treasures might they not conserve and develop if they would direct the play instinct into the art impulse and utilize that power of variation which industry so sadly needs no force will be sufficiently powerful and widespread to redeem industry from its mechanism and materialism save the freed power in every single individual in order to do this however we must go back a little over the educational road to a training of the child's imagination as well as his careful equipment with a technique a little child makes a very tottering house of cardboard and calls it a castle the important feature there lies in the fact that he has expressed a castle and it is not for his teacher to draw undue attention to the fact that the corners are not well put together but rather to listen to and to direct the story which centers about his effort at creative expression a little later however it is clearly the business of the teacher to call attention to the quality of the dovetailing in which the boy at the manual training bench is engaged for there is no value in dovetailing a box unless it is accurately done at one point the child's imagination is to be emphasized and at another point his technique is important and he will need both in the industrial life ahead of him there is no doubt that there is a third period when the boy is not interested in the making of a castle or a box or anything else unless it appears to him to bear a direct relation to the future unless it has something to do with earning a living at this later moment he is chiefly anxious to play the part of a man and to take his place in the world the fact that a boy of fourteen wants to go out and earn his living makes that the moment when he should be educated with reference to that interest and the records of many high schools show that if he is not thus educated he bluntly refuses to be educated at all the forces pulling him to work are not only the overmastering desire to earn money and be a man but if the family purse is small and empty include also his family loyalty and affection and over against them we at present place nothing but a vague belief on the part of his family and himself that education is a desirable thing and may eventually help him on in the world it is of course difficult to adapt education to this need it means that education must be planned so seriously and definitely for those two years between fourteen and sixteen that it will be actual trade training so far as it goes with attention given to the condition under which money will be actually paid for industrial skill but at the same time that the implications the connections the relations to the industrial world will be made clear a man who makes year after year but one small wheel in a modern watch factory may if his education has properly prepared him have a fuller life than did the old watchmaker who made a watch from beginning to end it takes thirty-nine people to make a coat in a modern tailoring establishment yet those same thirty-nine people might produce a coat in a spirit of teamwork which would make the entire process as much more exhilarating than the work of the old solitary tailor as playing in a baseball nine gives more pleasure to a boy than that afforded by a solitary game of handball on the side of the barn but it is quite impossible to imagine a successful game of baseball in which each player should be drilled only in his own part and should know nothing of the relation of that part to the whole game in order to make the watch wheel or the coat collar interesting they must be connected with the entire product must include fellowship as well as the pleasures arising from skilled workmanship and a cultivated imagination when all the young people working in the factories shall come to use their faculties intelligently and as a matter of course to be interested in what they do then our manufactured products may at last meet the demands of a cultivated nation because they will be produced by cultivated workmen the machine will not be abandoned by any means but will be subordinated to the intelligence of the man who manipulates it and will be used as a tool 
it may come about in time that an educated public will become inexpressibly bored by manufactured objects which reflect absolutely nothing of the minds of the men who made them that they may come to dislike an object made by twelve unrelated men even as we do not care for a picture which has been painted by a dozen different men not because we have enunciated a theory in regard to it but because such a picture loses all its significance and has no meaning or message we need to apply the same principle but very little further until we shall refuse to be surrounded by manufactured objects which do not represent some gleam of intelligence on the part of the producer hundreds of people have already taken that step so far as all decoration and ornament are concerned and it would require but one short step more in the meantime we are surrounded by stupid articles which give us no pleasure and the young people producing them are driven into all sorts of expedients in order to escape work which has been made impossible because all human interest has been extracted from it that this is not mere theory may be demonstrated by the fact that many times the young people may be spared the disastrous effects of this third revolt against the monotony of industry if work can be found for them in a place where the daily round is less grinding and presents more variety fortunately in every city there are places outside the factories where occupation of a more normal type of labor may be secured and often a restless boy can be tided over this period if he is put into one of these occupations the experience in every boys club can furnish illustrations of this a factory boy who had been brought into the juvenile court many times because of his persistent habit of borrowing the vehicles of physicians as they stood in front of the houses of patients always meaning to get back before the doctor came out led a contented and orderly life after a place had been found for him as a stable boy in a large livery establishment where his love for horses could be legitimately gratified still another boy made the readjustment for himself in spite of the great physical suffering involved he had lost both legs at the age of seven flipping cars when he went to work at fourteen with two good cork legs which he vainly imagined disguised his disability his employer kindly placed him where he might sit throughout the entire day and his task was to keep tally on the boxes constantly hoisted from the warehouse into cars the boy found this work so dull that he insisted upon working in the yards where the cars were being loaded and switched he would come home at night utterly exhausted more from the extreme nervous tension involved in avoiding accidents than from the tremendous exertion and although he would weep bitterly from sheer fatigue nothing could induce him to go back to the duller and safer job fortunately he belonged to a less passionate race than the poor little italian girl in the hall house neighborhood who recently battered her head against the wall so long and so vigorously that she had to be taken to a hospital because of her serious injuries so nearly as dull grown-ups could understand it had been an hysterical revolt against factory work by day and no fun in the evening america perhaps more than any other country in the world can demonstrate what applied science has accomplished for industry it has not only made possible the utilization of all sorts of unpromising raw material but it has tremendously increased the invention and elaboration of machinery the time must come however if indeed the moment has not already arrived when applied science will have done all that it can do for the development of machinery it may be that machines cannot be speeded up any further without putting unwarranted strain upon the nervous system of the worker it may be that further elaboration will so sacrifice the workman who feeds the machine that industrial advance will lie not in the direction of improvement in machinery but in the recovery and education of the workman this refusal to apply the art of life to industry continually drives out of it many promising young people some of them impelled by a creative impulse which will not be denied avoid industry altogether and demand that their ambitious parents give them lessons in china painting and artwork which clutters the overcrowded parlor of the more prosperous working man's home with useless decorated plates and hand-painted drapes whereas the plates upon the table and the rugs upon the floor used daily by thousands of weary housewives are totally untouched by the beauty and variety which this ill-directed art instinct 
might have given them had it been incorporated into industry i could cite many instances of high-spirited young people who suffer a veritable martyrdom in order to satisfy their artistic impulse a young girl of fourteen whose family had for years displayed a certain artistic aptitude the mother having been a singer and the grandmother with whom the young girl lived a clever worker in artificial flowers had her first experience of wage earning in a box factory she endured it only for three months and then gave up her increasing wage in exchange for a dollar fifty a week which she earns by making sketches of dresses cloaks and hats for the advertisements of a large department store a young russian girl of my acquaintance starves on the irregular pay which she receives for her occasional contributions to the sunday newspapers meanwhile writing her novel rather than return to the comparatively prosperous wages of a necktie factory which she regards with horror another girl washes dishes every evening in a cheap boarding-house in order to secure the leisure in which to practice her singing lessons rather than to give them up and return to her former twelve dollar a week job in an electrical factory the artistic expression in all these cases is crude but the young people are still conscious of that old sacrifice of material interest which art has ever demanded of those who serve her and which doubtless brings its own reward that the sacrifice is in vain makes it all the more touching and is an indictment of the educator who has failed to utilize the art instinct in industry something of the same sort takes place among many lads who find little opportunity in the ordinary factories to utilize the instinct for workmanship or among those more prosperous young people who establish studios and art shops in which with a vast expenditure of energy they manufacture luxurious articles the educational system in germany is deliberately planned to sift out and to retain in the service of industry all such promising young people the method is as yet experimental and open to many objections but it is so far successful that made in germany means made by a trained artisan and in many cases by a man working with the freed impulse of the artist the london county council is constantly urging plans which may secure for the gifted children in the board schools support in technological institutes educators are thus gradually developing the courage and initiative to conserve for industry the young worker himself so that his mind his power of variation his art instinct his intelligent skill may ultimately be reflected in the industrial product that would imply that industry must be seized upon and conquered by those educators who now either avoid it altogether by taking refuge in the caves of classic learning or beg the question by teaching the tool industry advocated by ruskin and morris in their first reaction against the present industrial system it would mean that educators must bring industry into the kingdom of the mind and pervade it with the human spirit the discovery of the labor power of youth was to our age like the discovery of a new natural resource although it was merely incidental to the invention of modern machinery and the consequent subdivision of labor in utilizing it thus ruthlessly we are not only in danger of quenching the divine fire of youth but we are imperiling industry itself when we venture to ignore these very sources of beauty of variety and of suggestion that is the end of chapter five six of the spirit of youth and the city streets this librivox recording is in the public domain the spirit of youth and the city streets by jane adams read by mary schneider chapter six the thirst for righteousness even as we pass by the joy and beauty of youth on the streets without dreaming it is there so we may hurry past the very presence of august things without recognition we may easily fail to sense those spiritual realities which in every age have haunted youth and called to him without ceasing historians tell us that the extraordinary advances in human progress have been made in those times when quote, the ideals of freedom and law of youth and beauty of knowledge and virtue of humanity and religion 
high things the conflicts between which have caused most of the disruptions and despondences of human society seem for a generation or two to lie in the same direction are we perhaps at least twice in life's journey dimly conscious of the needlessness of this disruption and of the futility of the despondency do we feel at first when young ourselves we long to interrogate the transfigured few among our elders whom we believe to be carrying forward affairs of gravest import failing to accomplish this are we for the second time dogged by a sense of lost opportunity of needless waste and perplexity when we too as adults see again the dreams of youth in conflict with the efforts of our own contemporaries we see idealistic endeavor on the one hand lost in ugly friction the heat and burden of the day borne by mature men and women on the other hand increased by their consciousness of youth's misunderstanding and high scorn it may relieve the mind to break forth in moments of irritation against the folly of the coming generation but whoso pauses in his plodding way to call even his youngest and rashest brother a fool ruins thereby the joy of his journey for youth is so vivid an element in life that unless it is cherished all the rest is spoiled the most praiseworthy journey grows dull and leaden unless companioned by youth's iridescent dreams not only that but the mature of each generation run a grave risk of putting their efforts in a futile direction in a blind alley as it were unless they can keep in touch with the youth of their own day and know at least the trend in which eager dreams are driving them those dreams that fairly buffet our faces as we walk the city streets at times every one possessed with a concern for social progress is discouraged by the formless and unsubdued modern city as he looks upon that complicated life which drives men almost without their own volition that life of ingenuous enterprises great ambitions political jealousies where men tend to become mere slaves of possessions doubtless these striving men are full of weakness and sensitiveness even when they rend each other and are but caught in the coils of circumstance nevertheless a serious attempt to ennoble and enrich the content of city life that it may really fill the ample space their ruthless wills have provided means that we must call upon energies other than theirs when we count over the resources which are at work to make order out of casualty beauty out of confusion justice kindliness and mercy out of cruelty and inconsiderate pressure we find ourselves appealing to the confident spirit of youth we know that it is crude and filled with conflicting hopes some of them unworthy and most of them doomed to disappointment yet these young people have the advantage of mourning in their hearts they have such power of direct action such ability to stand free from fear to break through life's trammelings that in spite of ourselves we become convinced that Quote, they to the disappointed earth shall give the lives we meant to live End quote. that this solace comes to us only in fugitive moments and is easily misleading may be urged as an excuse for our blindness and insensitiveness to the august moral resources which the youth of each city offers to those who are in the midst of the city's turmoil a further excuse is afforded in the fact that the form of the dreams for beauty and righteousness change with each generation and that while it is always difficult for the fathers to understand the sons at those periods when the demand of the young is one of social reconstruction the misunderstanding easily grows into bitterness the old desire to achieve to improve the world seizes the ardent youth today with a stern command to bring about juster social conditions youth's divine impatience with the world's inheritance of wrong and injustice makes him scornful of rose-water for the plague prescriptions and he insists upon something strenuous and vital one can find innumerable illustrations of this idealistic impatience with existing conditions among the many russian subjects found in the foreign quarters of every american city the idealism of these young people might be utilized to a modification of our general culture and point of view 
somewhat as the influence of the young germans who came to america in the early fifties bringing with them the hopes and aspirations embodied in the revolutions of eighteen forty eight made a profound impression upon the social and political institutions of america long before they emigrated thousands of russian young people had been caught up in the excitements and hopes of the russian revolution in finland in poland in the russian cities in the university towns life had become intensified by the consciousness of the suffering and starvation of millions of their fellow subjects they had been living with a sense of discipline and of preparation for a coming struggle which although grave in import was vivid and adventurous their minds had been seized by the first crude forms of social theory and they had cherished a vague belief that they were the direct instruments of a final and ideal social reconstruction when they come to america they sadly miss this sense of importance and participation in a great and glorious conflict against a recognized enemy life suddenly grows stale and unprofitable the very spirit of tolerance which characterizes american cities is that which strikes most unbearably upon their ardent spirits they look upon the indifference all about them with an amazement which rapidly changes to irritation some of them in a short time lose their ardor others with incredible rapidity make the adaptation between american conditions and their store of enthusiasm but hundreds of them remain restless and ill at ease their only consolation almost their only real companionship is when they meet in small groups for discussion or in larger groups to welcome a well-known revolutionist who brings them direct news from the conflict or when they arrange for a demonstration in memory of the red sunday or the death of Gershuni. such demonstrations however are held in honor of men whose sense of justice was obliged to seek an expression quite outside the regular channels of established government knowing that russia has forced thousands of her subjects into this position one would imagine that patriotic teachers in america would be most desirous to turn into governmental channels all that insatiable desire for juster relations in industrial and political affairs a distinct and well-directed campaign is necessary if this enthusiasm is ever to be made part of that old and still incomplete effort to embody in law the law that abides and falters not ages long the highest aspirations of justice unfortunately we do little or nothing with this splendid store of youthful ardor and creative enthusiasm through its very isolation it tends to intensify and turn in upon itself and no direct effort is made to moralize it to discipline it to make it operative upon the life of the city and yet it is perhaps what american cities need above all else for it is but too true that democracy a people ruling the very name of which the greeks considered so beautiful no longer stirs the blood of the american youth and that the real enthusiasm for self-government must be found among the groups of young immigrants who bring over with every ship a new cargo of democratic aspirations that many of these young men look for a consummation of these aspirations to a social order of the future in which the industrial system as well as government shall embody democratic relations simply shows that the doctrine of democracy like any other of the living faiths of men is so essentially mystical that it continually demands new formulation to fail to recognize it in a new form to call it hard names to refuse to receive it may mean to reject that which our fathers cherished and handed on as an inheritance not only to be preserved but also to be developed we allow a great deal of this precious stuff this weltschmerz of which each generation has need not only to go unutilized but to work havoc among the young people themselves one of the saddest illustrations of this in my personal knowledge was that of a young russian girl who lived with a group of her compatriots on the west side of chicago she recently committed suicide at the same time that several others in the group tried it and failed one of these latter who afterwards talked freely of the motives which led her to this act said that there were no great issues at stake in this country that america was wholly commercial in its interests and absorbed in money-making that americans were not held together by any historic bonds nor great mutual hopes and were totally ignorant of the stirring social and philosophical movements of europe 
that her life here had been a long dreary economic struggle unrelieved by any of the higher interests that she was tired of getting seventy-five cents for trimming a hat that sold for twelve dollars and was to be put upon the empty head of someone who had no concern for the welfare of the woman who made it the statement doubtless reflected something of the sorrows of werther but the entire tone was nobler and more highly socialized it is difficult to illustrate what might be accomplished by reducing to action the ardor of those youths who so bitterly arraign our present industrial order while no part of the social system can be changed rapidly we would all admit that the present industrial arrangements in america might be vastly improved and that we are failing to meet the requirements of our industrial life with courage and success simply because we do not realize that unless we establish that humane legislation which has its roots in a consideration for human life our industrialism itself will suffer from inbreeding growing ever more unrestrained and ruthless it would seem obvious that in order to secure relief in a community dominated by industrial ideals an appeal must be made to the old spiritual sanctions for human conduct that we must reach motives more substantial and enduring than the mere fleeting experiences of one phase of modern industry which vainly imagines that its growth would be curtailed if the welfare of its employees were guarded by the state it would be an interesting attempt to turn that youthful enthusiasm to the aid of one of the most conservative of present social efforts the almost world-wide movement to secure protective legislation for women and children in industry in which america is so behind the other nations fourteen of the great european powers protect women from all-night work from excessive labor by day because paternalistic governments prize the strength of women for the bearing and rearing of healthy children to the state and yet in a republic it is the citizens themselves who must be convinced of the need of this protection unless they would permit industry to maim the very mothers of the future in one year in the german empire one hundred thousand children were cared for through money paid from the state insurance fund to their widowed mothers or to their invalided fathers and yet in the american states it seems impossible to pass a most rudimentary employer's liability act which would be but the first step towards that code of beneficent legislation which protects the widow and fatherless in germany and england certainly we shall have to bestir ourselves if we would care for the victims of the industrial order as well as do other nations we shall be obliged speedily to realize that in order to secure protective legislation from a governmental body in which the most powerful interests represented are those of the producers and transporters of manufactured goods it will be necessary to exhort to a care for the defenseless from the religious point of view to take even the non-commercial point of view would be to assert that evolutionary progress assumes that a sound physique is the only secure basis of life and to guard the mothers of the race is simple sanity and yet from lack of preaching we do not unite for action because we are not stirred to act at all and protective legislation in america is shamefully inadequate because it is always difficult to put the championship of the oppressed above the counsels of prudence we say in despair sometimes that we are a people who hold such varied creeds that there are not enough of one religious faith to secure anything but the truth is that it is easy to unite for action people whose hearts have once been filled by the fervor of that willing devotion which may easily be generated in the youthful breast it is comparatively easy to enlarge a moral concept but extremely difficult to give it to an adult for the first time and yet when we attempt to appeal to the old sanctions for disinterested conduct the conclusion is often forced upon us that they have not been ingrained into character that they cannot be relied upon when they are brought into contact with the arguments of industrialism that the colors of the flag flying over the fort of our spiritual resources wash out and disappear when the storm actually breaks 
it is because the ardor of youth has not been attracted to the long effort to modify the ruthlessness of industry by humane enactments that we sadly miss their resourceful enthusiasm and that at the same time groups of young people who hunger and thirst after social righteousness are breaking their hearts because the social reform is so long delayed in an unsympathetic and hard-hearted society frustrates all their hopes and yet these ardent young people who obscure the issue by their crying and striving and looking in the wrong place might be of inestimable value if so-called political leaders were in any sense social philosophers to permit these young people to separate themselves from the contemporaneous efforts of ameliorating society and to turn their vague hopes solely toward an ideal commonwealth of the future is to withdraw from an experimental self-government founded in enthusiasm the very stores of enthusiasm which are needed to sustain it the championship of the oppressed came to be a spiritual passion with the hebrew prophets they saw the promises of religion not for individuals but in the broad reaches of national affairs and in the establishment of social justice it is quite possible that such a spiritual passion is again to be found among the ardent young souls of our cities they see a vision not of a purified nation but of a regenerated and reorganized society shall we throw all this into the future into the futile prophecy of those who talk because they cannot achieve or shall we commingle their ardor their overmastering desire for social justice with that more sober effort to modify existing conditions are we once more forced to appeal to the educators is it so difficult to utilize this ardor because educators have failed to apprehend the spiritual quality of their task it would seem a golden opportunity for those to whom is committed the task of spiritual instruction for to preach and seek justice in human affairs is one of the oldest obligations of religion and morality all that would be necessary would be to attach this teaching to the contemporary world in such wise that the eager youth might feel a tug upon his faculties and a sense of participation in the moral life about him to leave it unattached to actual social movements means that the moralist is speaking in incomprehensible terms without this connection the religious teachers may have conscientiously carried out their traditional duties and yet have failed utterly to stir the fires of spiritual enthusiasm each generation of moralists and educators find themselves facing an inevitable dilemma first to keep the young committed to their charge unspotted from the world and second to connect the young with the ruthless and materialistic world all about them in such wise that they may make it the arena for their spiritual endeavor it is fortunate for these teachers that some time during the golden age the most prosaic youth is seized by a new interest in remote and universal ends and that if but given a clue by which he may connect his lofty aims with his daily living he himself will drag the very heavens into the most sordid tenement the perpetual difficulty consists in finding the clue for him and placing it in his hands for if the teaching is too detached from life it does not result in any psychic impulsion at all i remember as an illustration of the saving power of this definite connection a tale told me by a distinguished labor leader in england his affections had been starved even as a child for he knew nothing of his parents his earliest memories being associated with a wretched old woman who took the most casual care of him when he was nine years old he ran away to sea and for the next seven years led the rough life of a dock laborer until he became much interested in a little crippled boy who by the death of his father had been left solitary on a freight boat my english friend promptly adopted the boy as his own and all the questionings of life centered about his young protege he was constantly driven to attend evening meetings where he heard discussed those social conditions which bear so hard upon the weak and sick the crippled boy lived until he was fifteen and by that time the regeneration of his foster father was complete the young docker was committed for life to the bettering of social conditions it is doubtful whether any abstract moral appeal could have reached such a roving nature certainly no attempt to incite his ambition would have succeeded 
only a pull upon his deepest sympathies and affections his desire to protect and cherish a weaker thing could possibly have stimulated him and connected him with the forces making for moral and social progress this of course has ever been the task of religion to make the sense of obligation personal to touch morality with enthusiasm to bathe the world in affection and on all sides we are challenging the teachers of religion to perform this task for the youth of the city for thousands of years definite religious instruction has been given by authorized agents to the youth of all nations emphasized through tribal ceremonials the assumption of the roman toga the bar mitzvah of the jews the first communion of thousands of children in catholic europe the sunday schools of even the least formal of the evangelical sects it is as if men had always felt that this expanding period of human life must be seized upon for spiritual ends that the tender tissue and newly awakened emotions must be made the repository for the historical ideals and dogmas which are after all the most precious possessions of the race how has it come about that so many of the city youth are not given their share in our common inheritance of life's best goods why are their tender feet so often ensnared even when they are going about youth's legitimate business one would suppose that in such an age as ours moral teachers would be put upon their mettle that moral authority would be forced to speak with no uncertain sound if only to be heard above the din of machinery and the roar of industrialism that it would have exerted itself as never before to convince the youth of the reality of the spiritual life affrighted as the moralist must be by the sudden new emphasis placed upon wealth despairing of the older men and women who are already caught by its rewards one would say that they would have seized upon the multitude of young people whose minds are busied with issues which lie beyond the portals of life as the only resource which might save the city from the fate of those who perish through the lack of vision yet because this inheritance has not been attached to conduct the youth of jewish birth may have been taught that prophets and statesmen for three thousand years declared jehovah to be a god of justice who hated oppression and desired righteousness but there is no real appeal to his spirit of moral adventure unless he is told that the most stirring attempts to translate justice into the modern social order have been inaugurated and carried forward by men of his own race and that until he joins in the contemporary manifestations of that attempt he is recreant to his highest traditions and obligations the christian youth may have been taught that man's heart-breaking adventure to find justice in the order of the universe moved the god of heaven himself to send a mediator in order that the justice man craves and the mercy by which alone he can endure his weakness might be reconciled but he will not make the doctrine his own unless he reduces it to action and tries to translate the spirit of his master into social terms the youth who calls himself an evolutionist it is rather hard to find a name for this youth but there are thousands of him and a fine fellow he often is has read of that struggle beginning with the earliest tribal effort to establish just relations between man and man but he still needs to be told that after all justice can only be worked out upon this earth by those who will not tolerate a wrong to the feeblest member of the community and that it will become a social force only in proportion as men steadfastly strive to establish it if these young people who are subjected to varied religious instruction are also stirred to action or rather if the instruction is given validity because it is attached to conduct then it may be comparatively easy to bring about certain social reforms so sorely needed in our industrial cities we are at times obliged to admit however that both the school and the church have failed to perform this office and are indicted by the young people themselves thousands of young people in every great city are either frankly hedonistic or are vainly attempting to work out for themselves a satisfactory code of morals they cast about in all directions for the clue which shall connect their loftiest hopes with their actual living several years ago a committee of lads came to see me in order to complain of a certain high school principal because he never talks to us about life 
when urged to make a clearer statement they added he never asks us what we are going to be we can't get a word out of him except lessons and keeping quiet in the halls of the dozens of young women who have begged me to make a connection for them between their dreams of social usefulness and their actual living i recall one of the many whom i had sent back to her clergyman returning with this remark his only suggestion was that i should be responsible every sunday for fresh flowers upon the altar i did that when i was fifteen and liked it then but when you have come back from college and are twenty-two years old it doesn't quite fit in with the vigorous efforts you have been told are necessary in order to make our social relations more christian all of us forget how very early we are in the experiment of founding self-government in this trying climate of america and we are making the experiment in the most materialistic period of all history having as our court of last appeal against that materialism only the wonderful and inexplicable instinct for justice which resides in the hearts of men which is never so irresistible as when the heart is young we may cultivate this most precious possession or we may disregard it we may listen to the young voices rising clear above the roar of industrialism and the prudent counsels of commerce or we may become hypnotized by the sudden new emphasis placed upon wealth and power and forget the supremacy of spiritual forces in men's affairs it is as if we ignored a wistful often confident creature who walked through our city streets calling out i am the spirit of youth with me all things are possible we fail to understand what he wants or even to see his doings although his acts are pregnant with meaning and we may either translate them into a sordid chronicle of petty vice or turn them into a solemn school for civic righteousness we may either smother the divine fire of youth or we may feed it we may either stand stupidly staring as it sinks into a murky fire of crime and flares into the intermittent blaze of folly or we may tend it into a lambent flame with power to make clean and bright our dingy city streets that is the end of chapter six and the end of the spirit of youth and the city streets read with great pleasure by mary schneider